Close it off. Okay. What up, Olay? What's up, Greg? What's up, Greg? What up, Olay? What's, What's up, Greg? Uh, it is my great pleasure to be here. I just want to say thank you for giving me the opportunity to come here and speak. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Greg Shu. I am the campus minister in charge of Asian and Varsity Christian Fellowship. Uh, we are one of the younger, we're like the youngest religious life group on grounds, and we're the fourth and, and youngest in our chapter. Uh, we in particular are a ministry both to and through Asian students at UVA, so you can help us know how to experience the gospel in a real way and share it in a way that really makes sense in the midst of real life and real culture. Uh, and I'd actually say, honestly, um, a lot of what we do and how I think about doing ministry to Asian students uh, has been reflected and I've thought through it because of my experience with One Way and what I've seen from you folks. So uh, even though in some ways you probably don't know it, you have inspired a lot of how we think about doing ministry. Um, so as you can tell, uh, just by looking at me, uh, and also as I told you, I'm the, I'm the speaker, I'm, I'm the campus minister in charge of AIB. Uh, you can see that I am Asian. No. And uh, so my parents came here about 10 years before I was born. And uh, so as a result of that, I grew up as, uh, the son of an, uh, as the son of immigrants. And if you're anything like me, money is a matter of considerable concern in your life. Uh, as an immigrant, we think a lot about money, like all the time, all the time. We think about money all the time. Um, you know, when, whenever, uh, when I was younger, the, the sort of the way I learned about how to think about money and the cost of things was, you should live like you're poor, because we were. And even when we're not anymore, you should still let, live like you're poor, so that you don't, so that you don't ever become poor again. And that was sort of our mantra when it comes to money. So always the, the cost of the thing, if I were to buy something, the cost of the thing was a sacred piece of information. You had to know it if you wanted to buy something. Um, and so, you know, these days, now that I'm a little older, I'll meet people, you know, from all walks of life, um, although I will say a lot of them are white, but, you know, they'll sort of say things like, oh, you know, I love a good sale, or I love a good buy, and I'm like, okay, like, I just, I mean, so do I, but I don't think that way. Like, you made it sound like you had a good buy, you bought something sort of on sale because you were, you took the extra time, and you were really savvy about your purchases. Like, it was a nice little treat you gave yourself in your, in your wallet because you were thoughtful that day. See, in my experience, that's not like a treat, that's like the law, right? That's like the 11th commandment in my household, right? It, it, it goes like this, thou shalt not buy it if thou don't need it, and if thou dost need it, thou shalt buy it for less. That's how we always suffer. Right? Uh, and so with this sort of like the 11th commandment, that's sort of the mindset I had when it came to money, you know, buy it for less. Now, I, I'll even say, so I have family in Hong Kong, and I used to go back every year to visit them. And we, we really, I really learned how to like buy it for less. Because sometimes when we, when we go to a shop for certain things, you actually have to bargain and haggle. So you can set the price lower if you're better at it. I learned all these like little tricks. My mom was really good at this. My dad is hopeless. My mom is really good at this. <laughs> and so we learned, I learned certain things from watching her. So when you go into sort of these shops to buy something, you got to put on a stank face so that you don't look like easy prey. Like you're mad. So like a, these jeans. <laughs> You always look mad, so they don't feel like they can just pounce on you and get and get, get, get the jump on you. No, you got to have the same face with your part, okay? Uh, another trick you'll learn is uh, whenever you sort of ask for the price about something, you got to ask if you're real bored, if you're real disinterested. How much, how much is that? Uh, what, about, what about that one? Oh. So you always got to make it seem like you're a little detached, but you're not, like they can't get a hold of you. And the best one is if so you kind of argue it out with them, like, man, I learned from off so well. Like, you learn it, you, you, you put it out there, you kind of always feel like, oh, that price, that's so high. That guy over there, so I was like, you never met that guy. Like, the guy over there, so for half as much as that, I ain't paying for that. That's too high, forget that. And then, and then, if you're really hard, you'll say, forget that, and you'll walk away. And then you wait for them to drop the price on you, because you're that good, right? So that's what I've learned. This is what I think of when I think of money. I did it a couple weeks ago with my cable contract. They raised it 30 bucks. I got on the phone. I was like, now you listen to me. And for 40 minutes, I got it back down to lower than I initially had it the year before. And that's what I do. That's how I think about money. All right? The cost of a thing matters a lot to me. You know, and maybe it matters a lot to you, too. I mean, thinking about it, like, if, you, if I know in UVA the demographics and stuff, I spent time here, a lot of minority students, maybe even most minority students, have some form of scholarship or, or loans to be able to come here. And maybe, maybe that means that, you know, you prefer to eat in the dining halls because that's covered and eating on the corner is not covered. Or maybe you're an RA because you, you know that that means room and board and stipend are kind of all in one, right? And you know that. Maybe you know the cost of a thing as well. Cost is important to me. And I think cost might be important to you too. But that fact means that uh, as I hang around church, 
I get really uncomfortable around Jesus a lot. Because Jesus talks a lot about cost. And I, I don't just mean he talks about money, though he does. He does talk a lot about money. But he talks about cost in sort of every sense of the word. See, I don't know what kind of what kind of parenting tactics you know Mary had on Jesus, but he didn't seem to have a spending limit for anything, right? He's out in the field walking with five thousand people. He says, "You know what we should do? Let's feed them all." And I'm like, "What? How are you going to feed five thousand people?" Now, of course, he's Jesus. He can make these happen, sort of like, <laughs> make, right? But you can imagine why his disciples are like, "Whoa! What do, you, what do you mean, feed them all? Like, we should really, we should really kick them out and go home, so we don't have to feed any of them, right? Because they're thinking about the cost of the thing, right? But Jesus gives a lot away in a way that kind of makes me uncomfortable. But then he also asks for a lot in a way that makes me uncomfortable. The cost of a thing is something that is always on my mind. And maybe for you, with spiritual things, with Jesus, the cost of a thing is the thing you're thinking about too. For some of us, we've heard all of this stuff that Jesus is asking for. The cost of what it means to follow Jesus. And some of us have, have decided that, you know, we're just not interested. We're not really interested in sort of going through all these hoops and giving up all this stuff. You know, maybe we keep Jesus around kind of as a, a buddy, the guy you call up when you get in jail, you need to be bailed out, or you're, you're, you know, you're drunk or something, you need someone to pick you up. He's your, he's your backup friend, maybe, maybe. But we're not really interested in giving this all up or whatever, we want to, or whatever he wants us to pay. We don't want to do that. We're not interested. And maybe there are some of us who say, okay, we look at this cost and we say, well, that's kind of steep, Jesus, but I'll give you some because you're a good guy. And so we give Jesus part of ourselves. We give him part of everything. And usually what that looks like is you do your Christian activities and you actually you're probably fairly proactive with them. You probably go to church every Sunday. You're involved in a fellowship. Maybe you're involved in a Bible study, even a discipleship group. Maybe you even pray every day. You do all this Christian stuff, right? Maybe we do all this Christian stuff. That's our part that we give him. The other part, I mean, usually we justify by saying, well, Jesus, look, I, I drink more than I should. Oh, this was sometimes. And I smoke things I should, but it's, it's only sometimes. And, uh, you know, like, if you're a girl, like, I date guys who are not marriage material, but, you know, whatever. Or if you're a guy, you date girls until they start talking about marriage and you drop them. Like, whatever it is, like, there's always a little part of things you say, no, Jesus, I don't, you don't have to go there. It ain't so bad. Because we always figure, you know, if I give Jesus part of everything, that's better than nothing, right? Some of us, we just give Jesus part because we think it's better than nothing. And then maybe there's some of us when, I think, when we think about cost. We're actually curious about Jesus. We actually want to get to know him. We want to know what he is like. Or maybe you already are following Jesus. But the thing about cost is that this is, it's just hard and confusing. Well, what does it mean to actually give him everything? What does it mean to follow after him this kind of way? Now, I can't pretend I'm going to be able to answer all those questions or thoughts or opinions. But I will say that you're not alone wherever, any, in any of those. Um, and I think Jesus actually wants to answer us to some degree about how we feel about cost. Because when I think about cost, I feel uncomfortable. And while Jesus doesn't shy away from that, I think he wants to help us understand why does it cost so darn much to follow him. We really want to know, Jesus, why does it cost me everything to follow you? And today, as we look at this text, um, you know, I hope that we can see that uh, you know, it costs my everything because Jesus wants, me, wants to give us his everything in return. Let's do his best. Luke 14, 25 to 35. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus. And turning to them, Jesus said this. If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and you are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is, he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him who has 20,000? And if he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, 
How can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile it is torn up. Whoever has ears will hear. As we move through this passage, uh, I'm hoping that we can understand and walk through some of why it costs so much. Because I think Jesus actually does want to address us in this place. Verse 1. Okay. The first thing we need to appreciate is actually, you know, often as I come into a passage, even though I've grown up in the church forever, you know, I come into a passage with a preconceived notion of Jesus. And oftentimes the one that I have is that Jesus is a sort of mean guy with like a holster of lightning bolts, and he's just sort of waiting to strike me down for something doing wrong. Especially a passage like this, where we're talking about giving up everything. We think about Jesus as sort of like this Zeus guy waiting to, to lightning bolt us for making some kind of mistake. Well, but if you actually read the text and you really understand the bigger picture of it, we have to actually put that particular view aside and let it speak to us and we have to listen to it. And that means that we have to appreciate that actually Jesus is being very, very fair. He's not hiding the cost. It strikes me this is a very, very blunt conversation. And oftentimes Jesus has these blood conversations among the twelve alone, you know, his like, inner circle. But if you read the beginning, it says he was traveling with this whole crowd in terms to all of them. All of them. And he tells them this. And part of me says, well, that's a little intense, Jesus. Why would you do that? Um, but I, I think it's because he wants to make sure we know what it is he's asking. Jesus is not a used car salesman. Jesus does not sort of give you the sort of first price, and then like he doesn't tell you what you're going to pay after. He's not the cell phone guy, sort of like, oh yeah, you pay this, you get a free phone, you get this much per month, and then six months later your prices jump, and all, all this red tape you didn't even know about. He doesn't do that. He's right here, putting the whole contract, everything about it, straight up front for us to see. And actually, I think that's extraordinarily fair. I mean, think about how many times you know you get involved in something. <laughs> Maybe you sign up for a major. Maybe it's joining a club, or maybe it's becoming an officer or some kind of organization. And you think it's going to look a certain way. And then a couple weeks in, you're like, oh, maybe that's a little different than I thought. But maybe I'll just get, just got to get used to it. And a couple more months in, actually, you're like, I hate this. Like, what happened? Like, nobody told me that comp school is so terrible. Like, no, why did anybody tell me these things? Right? Because sometimes, all we are told is sort of the good part, or the easy part. We're used to, the, it's a kind of a bait and switch. Jesus does not bait and switch, even though sometimes his churches do. But Jesus does not make a switch. He puts it out there, straight, us, straight for us to see. Moreover, I think it's important that we, we need to understand that this isn't Jesus being mean. It's also, it's almost mathematical what he's saying. Um, he, it's not like he's sort of wagging his finger. You know, now, if you don't do this, 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 and this, right? That's what we think of Jesus as. He's wagging his finger. He's disappointed. He's already disappointed in my behavior or my lack thereof. But that's not what Jesus is saying. I think he's saying something very mathematical. So, so think of it this way. A human being, right? whose heart is not beating, whose neurons are not firing, whose lungs are not breathing, I would not call that human being alive. You can't call me mean for saying that. There's actually no opinion. It's just a fact. If that's a, if that's a physical human being there on the ground, none of those signs are there, it would be, you'd be hard pressed to say, oh, that person is alive. So I don't think Jesus is sort of like, ha, ha you can't be my disciple. I think he's saying, look, this is what a disciple actually is. A disciple is like this. A disciple is like this. A disciple is like this. And friends, I think that's very fair. In fact, I think that's very gracious of him to make sure that, that I don't sort of fool myself. And it makes sense in the context of sort of this big crowd kind of falling around. Why did Jesus tell the whole crowd? Well, because he has a lot of followers of one sort. <laughs> he literally has a lot of followers. They're literally following him around from town to town, to place to place, to mountains to plains, right? to the city square, to the synagogue, to a house that's packed so tight you can't get in, except unless you tear the roof open and lower somebody down. There are a lot of people following Jesus around who are genuinely curious. But he doesn't want them to be fooled. Because maybe they think that sort of, oh, like, come on, if I come around and listen enough, maybe that's what it takes to sort of follow Jesus. Maybe these people are actually giving Jesus part of their lives. They're, they're spending time with him. But Jesus is like, oh, it's not just part. It's everything. He wants them to know. He doesn't load everybody up in the tour bus, and then we're rolling down the highway, and he says, okay, now here's what it's actually going to cost you. No, he doesn't do that. He says, before we get on, I want to make sure you know what this is going to cost. He's being fair. So if we have this preconceived notion that Jesus is mean, we have to put it aside. Maybe we have a lot of legitimate reasons for feeling that, but that's not what it's saying here. Jesus is not being mean. It's just math. He's just telling us the cost of the thing. But that's not all that he's doing here. Because as he continues, he uses three images for us that I think illustrate something about why we should follow him. Um, he likes to tell stories. We need to think sort of into his story. Sometimes these kind of stories, like, they frustrate me because I want to kind of 
I want it all very nicely systematized for me. You know, I want it kind of like a textbook. But Jesus uses a story to kind of get at the heart of things. And so let's kind of unpack them. He has three images. Let's go to the first one. The first one is a tower. It's about building. See, Jesus knows that we as people, we're builders. We build, right? Maybe as a kid, you like Legos. Like you, you build a lot of stuff with Legos, right? Uh, or, you know, if you're older now, you work out, you want, you know, you're a bodybuilder of some sort. But, but in a bigger sense, all of us here today, all of you here today in these seats, you know that building is important. That's why you're in college. You want to build something out of your life. You want to make something out of it. You don't want to waste it. You want to build something significant with your life. Maybe even you're the first one in your family who gets the chance to build something with your life through this particular opportunity of a university education. I don't think I need to tell you the importance of what it means to build something. Right here, that's what we're all about in a university like this. Building, Jesus knows that we care a lot about that. But the question is, what are you going to build? And what are you going to build it on? So we have this idea that life... All of our options is this vast open plane. And we can fill it with whatever we like. And I think in a, in a sense you actually can. If you're able, if you get the right luck and the opportunities and the resources, you can probably go about doing anything you want. I mean, you can think of plenty of great alumni or people from this university who have gone and uh, they've, done, they've done great things uh, with their lives. You know, you have all kinds of options before you. But I think um, UVA kind of gets a little carried away with this idea. I mean, so much so that this, this whole ideal of student self-governance, right, you know, all these, there's no clubs at UVA, they're all CIOs, right, mm -hmm. contracts of independent organizations. Okay, if that's not like the preppiest, most ridiculous, most pretentious, <laughs> sorry, you get the point. The point is, it's so important university, students can self-govern. And to a degree, I think that's awesome. I, I want us to grow and, and be strong people. But, but what we don't recognize is that actually this whole dream kind of falls apart we follow it to its full conclusion in the end. We have this idea like, oh, I'm self-governing, I'm going to do what I want. But if we do what we want, is it good enough? If we have all these options before us, on our own, is it actually good enough? And I don't think it is. You see, so I have a sort of unconventional high school experience. Maybe some of you have already heard some of the story, but I did not go to public school. I went to a New England boarding prep school. Like, Back in the day, we used to have to wear like ties and shirts and you know all this fancy, you know, dress code. We didn't have to do it when I was there, thankfully. But that's the kind of school that I went to. Uh, my specific boarding school, uh, some of our illustrious alumni include George Washington's nephews, both George Bush's and Jeb Bush, Samuel Morse, the guy who invented the telegraph, uh, and Bill Belichick, uh, the, the coach of the, the New England Patriots. Okay, so you get it. Like, we got some hot shots. That's my high school, right? And, and from the very beginning, this whole idea of like you are the, the best of the best, and in some ways really sounds a lot like UVA. I want to be honors of honor, all that kind of stuff. Like carpe diem, seize the day, get it done, make something with your life, make something out of yourself. And I heard that and I was like, yes, that is what I want to do. I had a chip on my shoulder from, from middle school and I was like, I'm going to do better now that I'm here. I want to make something of my life. I want to make a life that I can be proud of. I want to build something that's going to last, that's going to be awesome. So I spent my four years running about, doing all these different things to make myself proud when I look in the mirror in the morning. Uh, and, and specifically, I wanted to be popular, but not just popular. As a guy, you want respect, and so you want to be powerful. And, and also, as a hormonal teenager, I was like, well, I want to date who I want to date, however I want to date them, right? So these are sort of my main <laughs> criteria for what it meant to sort of be excellent. And the thing is that as I sort of invested in myself and applied myself in all these ways as an athlete, as a student, all these things, I pretty much got all the things I wanted. I was track captain as a senior, both winter and spring. My name is on the record wall uh, because of our uh, award-winning relay. We won, we won prep divisionals both my junior and senior year. Um, it was a point of pride to me that I was faster than sort of every other Asian in the prep league. That was a, a good thing. I was like, yes, like, I'm made it. I'm faster than everyone else in my ranks. I'm so awesome, right? <laughs> so this is a point of power, but I had that. Um, I was really popular. I was very well connected. I had good friends. Um, I, was a, I was a leader who was well respected among my peers. I got into Duke University, that's where I went for undergrad, so I got into a good school, and I had a string of girlfriends and less than girlfriends, and I'm not saying that's right, but that's what I wanted, and I got what I wanted. So by all normal accounts, when I was done with high school at this prestigious kind of carpe diem, New England boarding prep school, I looked forward and I said, you know, only more success is what is ahead of me. That's all there can be after all this. I've done very well. I'm ready for more. I built something. And so one day, the summer after graduation, I woke up, and for no apparent reason, out of the blue, I felt catastrophically depressed. It's the weirdest thing. 
I was fine the day before. You know, it, it, summer after after senior year, this for me was really fun. Like you're hanging out, you don't have anything to do, so you're just hanging out with your friends, your graduation parties, all these fun things to kind of celebrate all that you've done. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I wake up and I felt incredibly empty. Now you see, I've never been sure, so I said, oh, I know what this is. You know, I spent my last four years kind of like giving part of my life to Jesus, right? Like I was still at church, I would sing worship stuff, you know, I, I would even help with the fellowship at school, you know. I gave part of my life, and maybe now Jesus, because he's that, he's that douchebag, he's going to come back and ask for the rest. That's just what he does, right? He's, he, he knows the cost of the thing too, and, he, and he's going to keep a short account. He wants to come back and take it from me. That's what I felt. So I went to God, full of like anger. I was so mad. I said, all right, God, why are you raining on my parade? This is the best thing of my life. I'm the king of the world. Things are going great. Why are you raining on my parade? I kept shouting at God. Like, this, this went up for like a while. I just kept shouting at God. And he actually spoke back to me. And he said something that uh, was really unexpected. He said, oh, actually, Greg, it's not my fault that you feel it. I said, what are you talking about? I know you. I know you, Lord. You convict, right? You make them feel, you make them feel bad. We go to worship. You make us cry. I know you, Lord. You, you come from me. I know you. Why do you feel this way, right? And he said, no, 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 Greg, you don't understand. I have nothing to do with this. Because for the last four years, you have been so dead set on building your own empire, building your own kingdom, building your own life, that I let you have it. Because you wanted it so bad. You gripped it so tight. You were so... Uh, you just wanted it so much that I had to let you. So whatever you feel right now, I promise you it is not me kind of afflicting or convicting you. It's not me. Whatever you feel right now is just you. So I said, I was confused. So, okay, how is that even possible? How can I feel this way? Why do I feel this way, God? He said, well, son, maybe. Maybe it's because you spent the last four years building your life out of things that crumble just to ash. And if you build your life on a pile of ashes, eventually... You're going to start to have some breathing problems. You're going to start to cough. You're going to start to feel sick. If you build your life on a trash heap, it is going to start to smell. Maybe that's what you're feeling right now. You should go and think about that. <laughs> so I said, okay. I was confused, though. I said, you know, I, I, I had to wrestle with that a lot that summer. Because I said, well, like, you know, I looked at all my leadership, and I, I was more respected than my peers. I wasn't, I wasn't a faker. I was genuine with people. But I realized that God was right because at the end of the day, all of my good work, whether in church or out of it, was all for me. All for me. And because of there was something in there that wasn't strong enough to make it last, it would collapse in on itself. It wasn't perfect. I just happened to get this lesson earlier than most. Because I went to a boarding prep school and I got all that sort of independence at the age of 15 instead of 19. But everybody gets it at some point, I think. If you haven't gotten it yet, I think you will. Oftentimes we get it in college because we try something we think we can do or even we want to do. It might even be a good thing. We don't get it. A lot of people try to get into the comp school or the Curry school or A school, any of those things. You don't get it. And then what? Well, can't do it. Many people try, especially in this market, we're looking for internships and jobs. You're trying to get into med school. Anyone trying to get into med school knows how hard it is, right? You want to do something and you can't. You can't do it. But even for those who are successful, I think it comes and catches up with you eventually. In particular, I think it's very obvious with men. Um, you know, even if you have success right out of school, maybe you go into banking or something, or you go into business and you make a bunch of money. Um, at some point, usually 30 years down the line, for some reason, your very fat bank account no longer makes you comfortable. And your very hot wife no longer makes you happy. So for some reason, at that point, in the midlife crisis of a, of a man, we all want to go buy a sports car and find ourselves an intern having an affair with. That's just the way it is. We built something and all of a sudden it stops working. Why is that? Because frankly, we're not good at self-governance, friends. We're not. We are actually not designed for self-governance. We've been designed for God governance. We were not meant to build life on our own. We were meant to build life with God alongside Him so that it would be beautiful and right and righteous. Because when Jesus talks about building a tower, I wonder if it's because he's also called the cornerstone in other places of scripture. The cornerstone is the one that you put down in the ground that goes the deepest, that is the heaviest, that is the hardest. And so when you build the rest of the building around it, nothing else falls. Because it is strong enough to take the rest. Even if you build the building higher and higher and higher and higher, the cornerstone is strong enough to hold it up. Jesus is the cornerstone. And so when he talks about a tower... I wonder if he's trying to tell me that I need him as the cornerstone or my life is going to fall apart. 
like it always does. Like this analogy he says, right? You built yourself a tower, you laid the foundation, you started going, and then what? You ran out of resources, you ran out of wisdom, something happened, you didn't finish. And all your life is just a mess. A tower with no roof is not a tower, right? House with no walls is not a house. It's not finished. It's not good enough. It didn't last. We need something better. Now, I know you're going to build something with your life. We all will. But have you considered building it upon the cornerstone named Jesus? Have you considered building it upon the rock of ages? The one who set the foundations of the very earth. <laughs> the one who is truly good. Because you should think about that. That's what this passage is telling us. We should consider, what are we building our lives upon? Let's go to the next one. The second analogy that Jesus talks about is of a king going to war. There's a king, and he's got 10,000 men, and for some reason he's opposed to this other king. This other king has 20,000 men, and this other king is the one who's invading, right? The way it's described, right? So, so you and I, we're the king with the 10,000, and this other king is coming at us, and he's got twice as many people. And I think Jesus is using this analogy for us because some of us in here are fighters. It's in our nature, right? You, you just are arguing for some of us as sort of like a way of expressing love. Uh, we just, that's what we do. Your household, like, you know, people come and, like, see you and your parents, like, oh, ah, fighting, and, like, oh, my gosh, you know, their parents are like, oh, it's, it's okay. Like, it's normal, right? Like, some of us are fighters, but, but not just in terms of how we converse. Some of us are fighters in our spirits. Some, some in good ways and some in bad ways. You know, some of you in here want to be teachers or nurses or public servants or something. You want to contribute. And if any of you have, have ever wanted to do any of those things, you want to work for a nonprofit or an NGO or something, you know that the fight ahead of you is really hard. You know that. If any of you have ever thought about doing Teach for America or anything like that, you should know that the fight ahead of you is extremely, extremely difficult. Some would say even impossible. But you still want to. Something in you is telling you you should get up there and you should fight for that. Some of us are fighters. And some of us fight for things that are not so good. Some of us fight for things that uh, just sort of make us big and, and make us feel better about ourselves. But this fighting spirit that we have, I think Jesus wants to address both of us. For those of you who want to fight for good things, doesn't it sound like good news that one of the names of Jesus is Mighty Comfort and the Purveyor of Justice, the Righteous Judge? That sounds like good news to me. If you're in a classroom with low-income kids who don't really want to listen they have a bad home life, you go home at the end of the day and the tests all suck because none of them study, what are you going to do? You might just feel like it's, it's worthless, like it can't be done. But if the Mighty Comfort is on your side, then maybe that's enough to get you up for another day to go back into the classroom and try it again. Maybe the mighty conqueror can make a difference in your battles in life. Whatever you're trying to do, you want to write things that are wrong. You want to set things straight that are not. You want to put justice where injustice exists. You want to fight things in this supposedly post-racial society. Yeah, that's a joke. Come on. Right? Jesus wants to set those things aright. He's the mighty conqueror. And if you want to, that sounds like good news to me. That Jesus is a fighting king who's going to come and he's going to win. And he's got twice as many people as everybody else. That's good news to me. For those of us who fight for bad things, which admittedly has definitely been me in a lot of parts of my life, this analogy also speaks to us. And at first it sounds really bad. Because you've got 10,000, and Jesus has 20,000. It's actually an exaggeration. He's got 20,000 upon 20,000 upon 20,000 upon 20,000. 20, they don't even need weapons. They'll just like walk over you and kill all of them. Because they can. That's how powerful he is. So if you fight against Jesus, what Jesus is kind of saying, not to be a jerk. I'm going to destroy you. You don't stand a chance. And what does the analogy say? If you look at your chances, if you weigh the strategy, and you know the enemy king is coming at you with twice as many folks as you, you might consider suing for peace. Those of us who have opposed Jesus, who fight him, who resist him, who fight for what is evil, Jesus is saying, I am the conquering king, and I am coming to set things right. And if you stand in my way, anyone and anything who resists will be obliterated because I will not let it stand. Because I'm determined to set things right. But this analogy is interesting. Because, there's a, because there's, a, there's a way out from being destroyed. What does he say? He says, well, you can sue for peace. Now, some of us are like, well, I don't want to do that. <laughs> because Jesus always wants unconditional surrender. <laughs> Jesus doesn't sort of like give you part of your land. You know, no, no, no. Jesus, he's not unconditional surrender. But maybe that sounds unappealing because we forget what Jesus is like as a king. What kind of king is Jesus? Jesus is the only king who will take us, who are his enemies, and instead of beheading us as an example to others, will welcome us with open arms, will kiss us, and will love us. He'll put a robe on our shoulders and a ring on our finger, and 
He will feed us. We were his enemy, and he will do that to us. Jesus is the only king who will receive a surrendering enemy as somebody and say, you know, he will take all of our stuff, right? Unconditional surrender. But then actually, he'll give it right back with a different flag, and he'll say, actually, I'm going to help you rule the right way. What other king does that? No other king. No other king does that. No other king will take an enemy and make him one of his own and say, now you fight for me. Now you live with me. Now you're a citizen of my kingdom. Unconditional surrender to Jesus is actually not bad news. Friends, even those of us who resist, unconditional surrender to Jesus is actually immensely good news. Because it results in our lands being set right and us being welcomed into his kingdom. The final analogy that he uses is one of salt. <laughs> and I think he uses this one because he knows that we like to eat as people. We like to eat. <laughs> He knows that we like good meals. I mean, actually, Jesus likes good meals. If you like, read about him, like all the time, he's like eating food with people. Like that's like his primary motive for like discipleship, right? Like he doesn't like open your scripture. Like he, like you feel like, like two times like he he opens scripture and like preaches to people. He actually spends a ton of time eating with people. Oh, can I come to your house? Oh, you should come and stay with me. We're gonna eat, 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 eat. eat. And I think at least for me, like in AIV, we talk about food a lot. Like, food is one of the major ways sort of how we do fellowship, how we talk about sort of experience with God. So I think the analogy of salt for us is because Jesus knows that food appeals us and we understand food. Um, salt. And I think we as people, we are meant to be salt. He says that. He says salt of the earth in other passages as well. We are meant to flavor life. We are meant to add and preserve and add goodness to the things around us. You know, salt is a very simple thing. It's just two molecules, right? It's NaCl, very stable. Um, but Jesus talks about salt becoming unsalty. What does that look like? What does it mean for salt to become unsalty? Well, salt becomes unsalty when it's contaminated by other things. When other molecules or other elements or whatever, whatever happens can kind of break the bonds of that salt structure. Um, it no longer tastes like salt. It tastes like whatever else is sort of grafted onto it. And then at that point, salt's no good. You can't use salt if it's no longer salt. You can't use salt to preserve or to add flavor. Right? We can't do that. It's no longer good. See, sometimes we talk about Jesus like he's sweet, um, but Jesus here is talking about being salty. He's talking about being salty. He's talking about having flavor. And the only way for salt that's become contaminated to become salty again, the only way is for it to be purified. Maybe we've absorbed things around us or in our family or in the people that we know that have contaminated us. Maybe it's actually not even your fault. I'm not implying that it is. But we've been in some places that we have absorbed things that have kind of disintegrated the structure of who we're supposed to be. Maybe we, maybe we even know that. Maybe we even know that there's something kind of poisonous running around in there. The things that we've done or that we've seen that have been done to us. We're contaminated. We, we can't be salt. We can't be that stable, flavorful structure that we're supposed to be. We're contaminated. But friends, then I think it's good news that Jesus is the purifier. His death and his resurrection and an invitation back into the kingdom do what for us? Wipe it all away. They make us clean. It purifies whatever contaminants or darkness or wrongness is in us so that we become pure salt again. That we can flavor and do what we're supposed to. Because pure salt is a place in a meal. Dirty salt is not. And doesn't scripture also say, taste and see that the Lord is good? Jesus is speaking to us. That we have the opportunity also to be pure. Because when Jesus asks for everything, he's not being greedy. And these three analogies, just, they just point me to the fact that he wants everything because he knows that we're going to go out and spend our lives to build things. We're going to go out and spend our lives to fight against things. We're going to use our lives to, to, to sort of add flavor to the, the world around us. And the only way you can do that is with him, is what he's saying. The only way to do it right, to do it well, is with him. The only way... To have the full life we are meant to have is to give him our everything and receive his everything. It's the only way. You guys have to remember that um, when he says everything, that actually includes my sin and my brokenness and my flaws. And usually I think of sort of, oh, Jesus wants everything for me. And I usually only think of the good stuff or the fun stuff or whatever I want. But he's like, oh, I'm actually taking all your junk too. All of your debt, all of your mess. All of your wounds. When I say everything, I mean the bad stuff too. We only hear on the other side. Because Jesus is merciful. 
Because in Him, in return for giving Him our everything, we get every good and perfect gift. We get every new mercy of the day. We get every right and righteous thing instead. So where does that leave us? Well, basically where we started in a way. Jesus asks for everything. He wants it all. Everything must be subordinate to Him. He wants us to love everything more. He wants us to love Him more than everything else. All of it. We're supposed to love all of these things less than we love Him. And yes, the Christian life is hard. And if you've ever tried, some of it really sucks. <laughs> Following Jesus involves a lot of sacrifice. It involves obedience. It involves hardship. Those are not words that we are fond of. We really want the kind of fluffy, Jesus loves me, you know, this I know. That's what we want. But this is, right, this is the price tag. He's telling you straight up. You have to carry cross. You're going to have to put things in the right order. So what it comes down to is, uh, is this, this issue of trust. See, Jesus could be crazy, right? It's a crazy thing for someone to ask you, I want everything that you have. Give me everything, right? But if he isn't crazy, then what is he? That's a question of trust. Do you believe that Jesus is actually good? Do we believe that giving everything to Jesus is the right thing and the good thing? Do we believe that it's worth it? Do we believe that, that it's right for us? It's a question of trust. Do we believe that he is the cornerstone? Do we believe that he is the conqueror? Do we believe that he is the purifier? Are you willing to trust him with your life? Are you willing to trust him with everything? That's the question he asks for us. I want to give us some space to reflect on some of these things. And reflect on, you know, what, what areas maybe have I been holding back from Jesus? Or what things does he want me to give up next or, or to give up more deeply so that he can give me his full life instead? What am I holding back from? On the screen, there are going to be two things that Jesus says. And I think this is what he's offering us. He's offering us goodness and grace. These are two things that Jesus says. Because when he has a cost and a price tag, it's not for nothing. It's not you just give it all up and he sits it on fire just to prove he's God. No. He takes everything that we have so that we might get everything that he has. This is why he wants to take our everything. So he can give you his. Spend the time in silence just sort of reflecting. After a little while in one place. After a little while, uh, I'll pray for you.